Okay, I just want to welcome you to our uh, second summer lecture series with Tori Timmons. Uh, I'm sure you, if you've listened to the past lecture or if you've uh, read our newsletters, then you know Tori has been working with us since September of 2020. She's a research fellow here at the Historical Society, and she is working here in the Alice Bushnell House, and she's unearthed some just amazing artifacts. So we are so, so grateful to have Tori with us, and we are so appreciative of her doing this lecture series for us. Um, quickly, I will just say that uh, Tori is a recent Rutgers grad and is going on to continue her education at NYU. And she just recently learned that she has been selected to be part of the team to mount the exhibition at the Brooklyn Museum, the exhibition on uh, it was Christian Dior, sorry, Christian Dior. So that will be opening in September and Tori will be part of the team that's mounting that exhibit. So it's a huge honor. We are thrilled that we have Tori with us. And so I will turn it over to Tori. Hello, hi everyone. Right, welcome to the second part in our three-part lecture series this summer. Um, so today we're going to be talking about the Victorian era. Um, and we've got some really wonderful pieces from the collection here at the Historical Society that we're going to be looking at. Um, this is probably kind of the densest part of our collection is from this time period. So it's really exciting to be able to look at some of the pieces. They're really beautiful. And it's a really kind of interesting part of history. So if you're here for our lecture last week, um, we were looking at kind of the neoclassical Regency era and a little bit before that. So today we're going to be, as I mentioned earlier, talking about the Victorian era, which runs from around 1837 to 1901 and follows kind of the life of Queen Victoria in England. Um, and so despite the fact that Queen Victoria was obviously a British monarch and not here in the States, uh, she did have a really influential um, kind of time period on the throne, especially in regards to fashion. And it could be seen here in clothing in our collection here in the US, um, just as much as it was seen in Britain. So the first thing that we're going to be talking about today is starting kind of from the early part of her reign around 1837. Um, she was coronated in 1837, she got married in um, 1840, actually on February 10th, which is my birthday. Um, <laughs> and she had a bunch of really notable kind of fashion aspects of her wardrobe that were very influential and became wide, very widespread in popularity. So a couple of the garments that we have in the collection actually exhibit this. So we're going to be looking at them today. And we're going to be starting with kind of the oldest piece that we're looking at um, today. Uh, which this is from around um, 1835 to 1837. Um, and I can bring it up here for you guys to look at. And I wanted to talk about this because of its association with Queen Victoria in the Victorian era. Uh, this is just a dress, a day bodice, um, and it does have a matching skirt, but I just wanted to kind of show uh, the full bodice because that's kind of the notable um, aspect of how it pertains to the Victorian era. And it has to do with the type of sleeves that it's being um, shown here. It's actually called a Victoria sleeve and it's still called a Victoria sleeve today. Um, if someone uses the style of sleeve in like fashion or modern dress. And essentially what it means is it's a sleeve that's got a cap on the top. It's got a puff in the middle. And then it's got either it gathers down to the cuff or it gathers down to a fitted lower part at the bottom. Um, very quickly, I want to do this because I forgot uh, when we started. I do have a list of vocabulary terms I'm going to send in the chat right now, um, just so you guys can bounce off of them if need be. Um, if not, that's perfectly okay as well. But I did that last week, I want you guys to have it this week as well. So this here is a Victoria sleeve, um, and it's called that because it was very, very um, popular within the wardrobe of Queen Victoria, um, especially during her younger years. So she was coronated at 18, but um, she was still very influential in the fashion kind of scene for probably the five years prior to that. So this is from very, very early on in her reign. Another notable um, piece in our collection that relates very heavily to Queen Victoria herself is this dress right here. Um, so if we want to bring the camera up, all right, I think we just got a guess. So yep. someone's coming in person to join us. Um, <laughs> but um, here 
is one of the very, very similar uh, or relatable garments in our collection to Queen Victoria, and it is a wedding dress from 1837, um, which or from 1840. So Queen Victoria was coronated in 1837 and married in 1840, and she actually made a very massive impact on the kind of bridal world as a whole to this day because she wore a white wedding dress. And we actually have a photo right here of the wedding dress that she wore. And as you can see, compared to this wedding dress we have here from around the same time, it's got this very deep V, it's got the pleated skirt, and notably it's white. So before Queen Victoria's wedding, it was not um, mainstream to wear a white wedding dress. Uh, we actually have a couple older wedding dresses in our collection that aren't white. So, um, it wasn't like a standard thing. People didn't do that all the time. They did it sometimes, but it wasn't as common as it is nowadays, where if you go into a David's bridal, it's gonna be like difficult to find a dress that isn't white. Um, and it can almost all be entirely tracked back to Queen Victoria. So that was a really influential thing that she did in um, pertaining to kind of fashion and the history of fashion in our collections here. Two other things that I just wanted to note regarding Queen Victoria herself and kind of um, how she relates to fashion of the Victorian era. Um, in the 1860s, um, she lifted a ban on tartan in the UK, uh, which previously had been banned as a form of kind of cultural suppression of the Scottish, um, meaning that during the later half of the Victorian era, there was a massive uptick in using tartan um, fabric for clothing in Britain and the US. We don't have any pieces in our collection that looks um, that are using that use tartan. However, I do have a photograph of a wonderful piece um, from the Met, uh, which is from around this time period. As you can see here, using tartan, it became very popular when she started wearing gowns made of it as well. And then finally, the last thing I wanted to note about Queen Victoria's direct influence on the Victorian era fashion was the fact that. Uh, following the death of her husband, um, Prince Albert, in 1861. She did go into mourning for the rest of her life, so almost 40 years for the tail end of the Victorian period, and that really pushed the popularity of mourning dress, especially during that era. So a lot of um, women, specifically if their husband or any of their family members died, would go into mourning, which is something that people have done historically, but became really prominent and very um, common uh, during this time period in particular, the later end of the Victorian era. And it can be traced almost directly back to Queen Victoria and kind of her mourning the death of her husband. Um, so we have a piece that we're going to look at a little later um, called the Dolman, which this one in particular is done in the style of mourning dress. And we have a couple other items upstairs in our collection that we're not gonna look at today, but we will look at that one later. So pertaining more to kind of what was going on in the Americas at this time, because obviously Queen Victoria is a very influential British figure to the point where, you know, the whole century almost is named after her. Um, in the Americas, we were amidst kind of um, the age of, um, sorry for that, we just had some water spill, that's okay. Um, <laughs> in America at the time, um, we were, amidst kind of this in, um, age of invention and the second um, industrial revolution. So there was a lot of stuff happening here pertaining to patents being made, new inventions, new techniques coming out. And they were very, very heavily influential on fashion during the Victorian era. So kind of the three very notable ones that I want us to keep in mind as we look at the collection today are um, the industrial age, industrialization of fabric production, um, which did happen in the century prior, but was really taking form during this time period. Um, fabric was being produced at a much larger scale than it ever had been previously because it was being able to be done by machines. So you were able to access much larger quantities of fabric than you could, you could previously when it was significantly more expensive. Um, and this can be seen in the skirts alone of this time period because they got much, much bigger and used much more fabric. And the reason they were able to do so is because fabric was more affordable. 
The next really important invention that I want us to keep in mind is the invention of the sewing machine, which was in 1846. And prior to that time period, every garment had to be made by hand, um, meaning that essentially it took much, much longer to create clothing. Now that the sewing machine had been invented, people were able to construct kind of the basic garment much faster, leaving a lot more um, time and accessibility open to um, decorative work, kind of specialized little hand sewing bits, um, doing pleating, doing embellishments, things like that, um, suddenly became significantly more popular because people could use the time they would have originally spent just hand sewing the garment together to now construct um, the garment using a sewing machine. And then the final really influential invention during this time period was aniline dyes, which I mentioned very briefly during our last lecture. Um, but aniline dyes or synthetic dyes were created in 1856 and they were discovered by a man named William Henry Perkins and it was actually an accident. And the color he discovered was the color mauve. Uh, so it's kind of like a purpley color. I actually have a photo we can look at really quick of a collections garment from Matt that was made in that color. Um, and basically, there we go. Um, so before this time period, it was really difficult to get very bright colors that would stay in fabric and last for a long time that you could wash that wouldn't just run out. Um, there was a limited amount of kind of natural dye colors, specifically in purple, and red and kind of like oranges and bright kind of colors that we might think of as um, you know, synthetic today. Um, and that had to do with um, the fact that essentially before um, the invention of aniline dyes, people had to use natural resources. So looking back throughout history, we don't see a lot of garments that are colored purple or red. And when we do, they tend to be associated with people who are very, very wealthy, very powerful royal families, Roman emperors, people who could afford to get the very extraneous materials needed to dye clothing that color. So because of the discovery of um, synthetic dyes and kind of chemical dyes, um, people were able to mass produce and mass make fabric in these really diverse colors that we were never seeing before. A wonderful example of that is our dress over here, our blue gown, which is made mm -hmm. using aniline dye and is much brighter than some of the older objects in our collection, such as um, you know, our 1830s gown and then our early 1850s gown, which is kind of right before the time that we're looking at. So let's take a look at some of the items that I have out today. So the first thing that we're going to be looking at is over here. This is our 1850s gown. Mm -hmm. uh, you can look in the camera. Okay? Um, can you just ask everyone to mute? Oh, uh, by the way, I was just asked um, if you guys don't mind, if you could just mute your microphones so we don't get the camera switching between ours and yours. That would be great. All right, so our first gown, or our second gown that we're going to be looking at today is this 1850s gown. And this style of dress um, would have been worn over a um, a undergarment known as a cage crinoline uh, or a hoop skirt. And essentially what a cage crinoline or hoop skirt did was it was invented to kind of give um, width to the skirt without having to wear multiple petticoats over one another and get really hot and really sweaty. Um, yeah, so this here is our 1850s gown. Um, it's worn over a cage crinoline. And this gown in particular is a really unique and interesting part of our collection. And I wanted to talk about it because it's actually a type of gown known as a transformation gown. These gowns are really special and I've only seen a couple other examples of them. There's one at the uh, Boston MFA, there's one at the Philadelphia Museum, but essentially what it is, is it's a type of gown where someone had a X amount of fabric and they wanted to be able to make multiple gowns out of it. So what they ended up doing was making an evening bodice and a day bodice. So this day bodice here has pagoda sleeves and a higher neckline, meaning it's kind of more modest, might be something you were to church or out, you know, to breakfast with your friends. Whereas this one here is more of an evening gown, something you wear to a party or to a dinner event. Um, it's got a little bit of a lower neckline. This time period was fairly modest, so it's not 
you know, as low as some of the other necklines you would have seen in centuries prior. And then it's got these little capped sleeves. So it's a really, it's there, it's a really special object in our collection because um, it's just kind of a unique piece. Basically, what they would do is when they wanted to wear this skirt with this bodice, they would switch it out and vice versa. Um, the other thing I mentioned were the pagoda sleeves. These uh, types of sleeves, the style of sleeves, was actually influenced by the trade that um, more Western countries had begun doing with um, Asian countries, which was really kind of gaining popularity during this time period in a similar way to how in last week's lecture, we talked about the influence of classical styles, classical you know, Greek and Roman uh, visuals on fashion. We were seeing a lot of this kind of Orientalism and uh, you know, Asian influence in our architecture and our um, decorative ideas during this time. And it was also found in the fashion of the time period as you can see through these sleeves, which were somewhat inspired by kind of a Chinese pao, which has um, wide sleeves at the bottom. So that's a wonderful piece for us to look at together. Okay. Um, all right, so, oh, with the cage crinoline, I'm gonna put my gloves on. So as I was saying about the cage crinoline, it was essentially invented to lift the skirt and to give it more volume without having to wear multiple petticoats one over top of each other. So we have actually a crinoline here in our collection, which is in pretty good shape. And I want to take out to show you guys. So cage crinolines were worn from kind of the early 1850s through the late 1860s. So the one that we have under our dress over there is from the 1850s. Whereas this one that I have here is from the later 1860s. And I will show you how we can kind of differentiate through the silhouette. So basically it pops out like this and it's worn under the skirt. And as you guys can kind of see when I hold this one up, it's not completely round. It's actually got a tapered hem at the back. And that has to do with the fact that it's from kind of the tail end of this period. It's from the 1860s and we're about to move into the bustle period. That dress that we have over there has a round hem. So that means that it's from earlier in the time period um, because it is less moving towards the back. So this cage crinoline is made out of strung, sprung steel. So it's basically steel kind of flattened wires that go around and it's uh, attached together using this cotton um, ribbon. And then it's got a waistband on it. And this would have been made in an industrial setting these weren't really made at home, uh, like most clothing prior to this time period was. Uh, this would have been you know, purchased from a store and it collapses down on itself. So as you guys can see, it stores pretty easily. Um, it doesn't take up a ton of space. And then also sometimes people get confused, like, oh, how did you get through doors? Like, how did you get you know, in and out of tight spaces? And the whole thing, you can kind of squish in on itself. So if you're trying to get through a door, you can kind of, push your skirt down and just glide on through. It's not like you get stuck in certain rooms or something along the lines. So this is a really cool piece in our collection. I was very excited when I came across it. And so, as I mentioned, the next kind of major time period during the Victorian era was the bustle era. And the bustle era can be split essentially into parts. So the first bustle period took place from 1870 to 1878. So as I mentioned with that cage crinoline that we just took a look at, that was the very end of the 1860s. Essentially what ended up happening is the cage crinoline started, it was round at the bottom. Eventually it started moving more towards the back. So we started getting more of like an ovular shape where there was a train at the back. And then at the beginning of the first bustle period from 1870 to 1878, um, it shifted pretty far into the back, but it was still very round at the front. So I will show you guys two photographs of um, what that kind of silhouette would look like. These are two photographs of garments and then like a fashion sketch oops, from this time period. So this is the first bustle period. As I said, it's 1870 to 1878. And it's not quite as like big bustly as we see later where it gets really big at the back. 
Um, however, you can kind of see how it's moving in kind of a direction away from the hoop skirt. And that's where it kind of originated from. Um, so the bustles that were being worn underneath it were bigger in the back, but still a bit round at the front. There was still kind of a softness to the front as a result of the hoop skirt. The second bustle period is from 1878 to 1883. And this was kind of the most unique bustle period. And this bustle period was kind of unique because everyone seemed to just all of a sudden get kind of sick of, you know, having all this fabric behind them at the bum. And there was still a bustle, you can see here, there's still a bustle. They were, they still had like a um, structure underneath their garments. However, um, the bodices were fitted over the hips. So they were kind of tight to the body and fitted over the hips. And there was just a little bump at the back. We didn't see the kind of bigger bustles that we saw before this and then after this. So this was the style of dress from around 18, uh, 1878 to 1883. So it was a shorter time period, but it was kind of unique. It was kind of a weird in the middle phase before we went back to the big bustle, which is the third bustle period or the shelf bustle. And that is actually the gown that we have here that we're about to take a look at. So the shelf bustle period, as you guys can kind of probably discern, was a period where it looked like a shelf essentially. So you can see there's still kind of backwards. Um, there's this long bodice, uh, which is similar to kind of the style that we saw in the period, the second bustle period. However, it's no longer fitted kind of down along the back of the body. They're wearing very big bustles shelf out through the back and flat in the front. So those are the three kind of bustle periods. If we want to walk over here and take a look at our third bustle period gown that we have in our collection, which I love and I think is quite beautiful. This was made using um, aniline dyes, which we talked about earlier. And if we go through, if we go over to the side and get kind of a side view of it, you can see where it shelves off the back. And our bustle that we have underneath is a little small, but it would essentially kind of come up and stick out the back and then flow over the bustle. So I will now <laughs> show you guys an example of what that understructure would have looked like. So. So we just took a look at the cage print one that we have in our collection. So now we'll take a look at one of our bustles. So we can kind of see how the shape is very similar. Oops. Let me make sure it all folds. It's very similar to the shape of the dress that we have over here, which that dress has a modern bustle underneath it. We don't want to put the weight of a garment over one of the older ones that we have in our collection. Um, however, you can kind of see it's very flat in the front. It's got kind of this, it's got um, ribbon in the front and then it goes around the side and it bumps out in the back. So this would have been from that last bustle period as well. As you guys can see, those two styles of like how they constructed the understructures for those garments are very, very similar. They both use sprung steel, they both, both use ribbon. They would essentially measure out the distance between, you know, how high they wanted the garment to go and then how far out they wanted it to go, and they would attach it using rivets. The difference basically came into the style of how they wanted the skirt to sit over top of the structure. So in the earlier um, Cage Kremlin era, they wanted it round, they wanted it big, um, they wanted um, the kind of straight hem silhouette. And then it started moving back towards the body. It started going over the bustle and they started accommodating the understructures to fit how they wanted the garments to lay. So the last kind of um, objects that we're going to look at from the 1890s are these two wonderful bodices. Um, so we unfortunately don't have a full gown from the 1890s. However, we do have these great bodices. 
Um, and this was kind of the tail end of the bustle period, the end of the Victorian era. And as you guys can see, um, there was a huge boom in the popularity of velvet. Um, just like there has been kind of in modern fashion recently, I think it's gotten pretty popular. Um, and these two gowns are really unique because of the fact that um, they were not made by someone at home. These two bodices were made by designers. Um, if we open this bodice on the waistband here, let's see if you guys can see. Ooh, oh my gosh, the backwards camera. Um, you can see it's got the name of the designer on the inside. And that's really important because prior to about the 1860s and the establishment of the House of Worth, which is a very major fashion house, if you've never heard of it before, um, people made their clothes at home for the most part, um, with the exception of like a few like, you know, very wealthy royal family, you know, Marie Antoinette had a seamstress that some people could argue was like the equivalent of a fashion designer nowadays. But before that time period, we really didn't have like fashion designers or people who like made a living off of designing clothing for people. And following the invention of the sewing machine, when people were able to, you know, make clothing in mass quantities for other people, as opposed to just having to spend time making clothing to dress themselves and their family, we started seeing a major uptick in people doing custom clothing and custom garments for, you know, the general public or the wealthy elite. So this bodice is a wonderful example of that because on the inside, it's got the label of the designer. Their New York based designer it says Madame Balmy. So she's based in New York City. It's got her address on there. And they were essentially constructing garments for clientele as opposed to just for themselves. Um, regarding the style of dress, as I mentioned, it's velvet, which was very, very popular during the 1890s. And it's got a hijo sleeve on it, which is on uh, your vocab sheets if you look at them. Essentially, it translates to a leg of mutton sleeve. It's French for kind of the back leg of a lamb or a, like a, a sheep. Um, and the reason it's called that is because it's big at the top and tapers down at the bottom. Um, so it kind of looks like a leg of mutton or a, you know, sheep's hindquarter. Um, and this is a beautiful garment and it's got beading on the mesh. And then it's got this velvet piecing on it. Let me make sure you guys can see. And then if you look at the back, it has the piecing down the back as well. So those are some really beautiful garments. Oh, here. Show this one as well. So those are going the wrong way. Um, this one is a wonderful example of what I was talking about earlier with people having more time to focus on detail work as opposed to just constructing a basic garment. They have this beautiful little knife pleating all down the front, which is something you would be much less likely to see in the time period before the 1850s, just because of the fact that it would have taken so much time just to construct the garment and hand sew the garment by itself. And they were able to put that energy towards kind of this beautiful pleating down the front. And this one also has the Gijo leg of mutton sleeves, as you guys can see here. And this is called a dolman. And this dolman actually is done in a mourning style, um, which I talked about earlier. Queen Victoria entered mourning in 1861 following the death of her husband and stayed in mourning until she died in 1901. And because of that, the popularity of going to mourning dress following the death of a loved one really skyrocketed. Like <laughs> a lot of people were doing it. Um, and it had been done historically, but not kind of to the extent that we saw during the late Victorian era. Um, this also reflected pretty heavily in kind of this like Gothic stereotype we have of what people wore during the Victorian era, because we kind of see this massive uptick in like black garments um, and Gothic style garments. So as I said, this is called a dolman. Essentially, it's a garment that kind of looks from the front like a bodice, but it's a cape and it's got this kind of cape like back to it. Um, and these became very popular during the last probably 20, 30 years of the 1800s. So it's got some beautiful embellishments and decorative pieces, little danglies and lace, and would have been worn by someone in mourning for the death of the loved one. 
the first accessory that we're going to look at is our pair of shoes. And this is a wonderful example of a style of shoe that was very popular throughout most of the Victorian era. As we talked about last time, in the 1820s, we started seeing shoes that were custom made for each foot. Um, prior to that, we didn't really see shoes like that. Um, however, these would be custom made for each foot. And they're much more intricate than a lot of shoes we were seeing in the centuries prior. These are um, a great example of kind of the style of boot that was being worn. However, even more popular than this lace-up style was button-up styles. So you would sometimes see shoes with kind of a curved button going up the side. Unfortunately, we don't have any of those in our collection. However, they would have been very similar to these ones. However, instead of the lace-up, we had the button up the side. Last week, we also got a chance to look at a chantelette, which is essentially a old-timey key ring. <laughs> um, however, our chancellor last week was much more delicate, much more dainty, and jewelry during this time period really started um, mimicking the medieval gothic kind of style of design as opposed to that simple, elegant, neoclassical design that we were seeing in the earlier half of the 1800s. So most of the, oops, most of the objects on here are very similar to the ones that we saw last week. On here we have a dance card, which would have been used if you went to a dance. Um, people would write their names on it to line up for you, uh, to dance with you. We have a pin cushion. Uh, we have a pin holder, and then we have some perfume. There's a couple that are missing, but aside from that, it's kind of all the necessities someone might need. It links onto your belt or your waistband, and they just pin it on. Um, and people would carry them around with them wherever you know they went in their day-to-day -day life. If you look at a lot of fashion prints, sometimes you'll see one hanging off. Um, but as I said earlier, this was done in a much more um, Gothic medieval style as opposed to the more dainty neoclassical ones that we saw earlier. Um, this is much harsher kind of um, bigger chains, more dramatic um, if you guys can see all of the little pieces hanging off. And that is a really cute object in our collection. Finally, I know we didn't talk a lot about menswear because we have a lot of women's wear in this collection, but I didn't think I could do a lecture on the Victorian era without mentioning these because they were kind of very important. Um, so we have here our top hat, um, which was an incredibly, incredibly popular garment during the early half and then throughout the Victorian era. This is our older one. This one is from more of kind of that Lincoln era, 1840s, 1850s, 1860s, kind of that time period. And it's got more of that stove pipe, straight silhouette. And then from the later Victorian era, we actually have this beautiful hat box that I wanted to show you all. Um, so, People who owned hats like top hats would have kept them in a hat box like this. If you're ever watching um, like a historical drama, a historical movie, anything like that, and there's a scene on a train, um, especially during the Victorian era, I would tell you to keep an eye out if the set decor decorator really knows what they're doing. In addition to luggage, you'll see a bunch of these hat boxes because people would travel with them. Um, so this is a hat box. You can see it's got the hat inside of it and this one is from a later time period this one is from the 1880s and we can see the stylistic difference in the hat from the one that we were looking at earlier oops got the band writing up a bit um it's got more of a curved brim and the hat kind of veers out. It's also shorter. So um, it's got less kind of of that dramatic stove type look. So I will hold the two hats next to each other so you guys can take a look. And it's very subtle. It's something you might not have noticed if you hadn't looked at them side by side. Um, but this is kind of the transition between the older style of top hat and the newer style of top hat. And despite that, it remained very persistent and very much worn throughout kind of the entire Victorian era. So that's kind of all of our collection highlight that we're going to be looking at today. 
Uh, we do have a lot of wonderful items from this time period, but I wanted to kind of pick out what I thought were the most unique and special um, to our collection here at the Historical Society. So if you guys have any other questions or anything you want to ask, um, feel free to chime in. I will open up the floor. Hi. Hi, Jerry. That was really, really informative. I was intrigued by, can you hear me okay, first of all? Yeah. Good. I was intrigued by how the, the bustles were evolving. And I was wondering if you have any insight into the why they were evolving into these different shapes. Hmm. I think it's very similar to how we see fashion evolve nowadays. It was just following kind of the trends of the time period. Um, and interestingly enough, um, I didn't get a chance to talk about it today, but um, looking at how style evolved and became, you know, influenced, especially here in the States, we were super influenced by what was going on in Britain, what was going on in France. Um, and so you might be wondering, like, how did we get access to, like, knowing what was happening over there? Especially we didn't have TV, we didn't have internet, like we do nowadays. Um, and there were multiple ways that, that was done. There, this time period, um, there was a massive, um, influx in the popularity of fashion magazines, ladies' magazines, um, where they would make prints similar to the ones that I was showing earlier. Um, like this. They would make fashion prints and publish them in these magazines alongside, you know, stories, advertisements, different things that they thought, you know, women would be interested in. And they could see what kind of fashion was happening in, um, France or in the UK. Um, and so there were uh, magazines that were specifically being published over there. Um, during the around 1830s, we started seeing magazines published out of New York and Philadelphia, meaning that smaller towns like Madison would have access to um, and to knowledge about what kind of fashion was getting increasingly popular in the big cities. Um, but that's kind of how people tracked like what the styles were, what was changing, what was kind of modern and updated, similarly to how you might like buy a Vogue magazine nowadays to see kind of what's on trend. Mm -hmm. So thank yeah. you. I hope that answered your question. <laughs> it did. I guess I was just noticing how like as the um, the hoops or whatever, as they were kind of elongating, I wondered if it was sort of a practical thing because people were just getting in each other's way. Oh. <laughs> so if they were trying to streamline the, yes, the silhouette a little bit, and more practical about, mm -hmm. you know, the, the fashion. Yes, that definitely could have been a contributing factor. <laughs> you could only have so many people in a house when they all have skirts that big. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank Corey, you. I don't know if anyone else has any other questions. I was wondering about the Chatelaine. What is it heavy? What, what is it made of? And then I also was curious, the same question about the hats. Are they felt and, and what? Yes. Um, so, so the chancelette, the chancelette is silver. Um, and most of the times they would be bought kind of as this chain piece by itself. And then they would buy little like extensions or whatnot to add to it. Um, and they would get a custom made out like a door or whoever they were purchasing their jewelry from. Um, so you could get these like switched out depending on what you wanted. Um, I know some of the other ones that we have have little tape measures on them. They might have perfume bottles. They might have a little mirror. Um, it just kind of depends on what it is that you want attached to your chancelette. Um, so it is metal. It's somewhat heavy, but like I would, I have, I have like a pretty heavy like key ring. I, to be fair, my, I have a lot of keys on my ring, but like I kind of would compare it to like a decent, like decently heavy like key, key ring. <laughs> That's basically the equivalent of what it would be used for. Um, and regarding the top hats, um, they were actually, there were two types of material used for top hats. Um, you would either get beaver felt um, or beaver pelts, which both of these top hats are made of, um, which actually uh, contributed a lot to kind of, um, during the very tail end of the Victorian era, there was this major push for um, environmental like conservation uh, as a direct result of top hats and um, women's hats during the time period. They started putting a lot of exotic bird feathers into their hats to the point where environmentalists were noticing that like it was detrimental to the bird populations 
And then we saw like this steady decline in top hats and um, women's kind of elaborate hats that were being worn during the time period as well. And same thing went for uh, the beavers. There was a major industry in beaver pelt collection in the Americas during this time period um, because it was utilized almost exclusively for top hats at the time. They were also sometimes made out of silk, um, but that was kind of considered like the cheap alternative, which is silly because it's still silk, but like um, beaver pelts, top hats, especially during the early time period, um, during the earlier time period, the early half of the 19th century, beaver felt was kind of this very luxurious good, especially in Europe, um, because it was an American good. Um, um, Mike, this may be hard to answer, but I'm really, I mean, these are very intricate garments. And I'm just wondering from a cost perspective, how would you know, one of these compare in cost to you know what people are buying today? Um, it's yeah. to me as though it would have been a bigger part of their, a greater share of their income. Mm -hmm. you have I think, to answer that, Tori? Yeah, I think the major thing to take into account is the fact that these garments were not being worn like once a week, you know, like how we will wear a blouse and then wash it and then wear it again, you know, two weeks later. These were garments that people were living in pretty consistently in kind of, you know, the case of the wedding dress, that's like a different story. That's like a special occasion thing. But these gowns were being worn, you know, pretty consistently in people's day-to-day -day lives. So it was more of like an investment into clothing, whereas you probably only had maybe three or four dresses that you would be wearing on a day-to-day -day basis. So this gown over here is definitely more of a day dress. Uh, it's even got, you know, the interchangeable top. So it's two different dresses. Um, whereas this one is also a day dress, but it's kind of later in the time period. Um, so things are getting more intricate in regards to detail um, and style and the, the color and all that kind of thing. But um, I can't put an exact price on it. It definitely wasn't the equivalent to going to like Target and buying a $5 t-shirt um, <laughs> because it was kind of an investment that you were going to have, you know, actively in your life that you'd be wearing a lot. And, you know, your wardrobe was a lot smaller than, you know, most people's wardrobes are nowadays. So it was more acceptable to be spending more money on garments, um, especially compared to nowadays where it's like, you can just, you know, buy as much clothing as you want and watch it as much as you want. Another thing kind of to bounce off of that is that um, these weren't being worn like directly on the skin. Like I just have a shirt on right now and it's being worn, you know, on my skin people would have had like a chemise or a little um, undershirt underneath it. And that's what they would have washed, you know, relatively consistently. Still not every day, you know, still not every time they wore it, but they would wash it probably like once a week. Garments like this weren't really being washed like at all. Um, maybe if they like got something on it, they would wash it off, but it wasn't um, at all like what we do nowadays where you kind of wash your clothes consistently. Um, they were, washing the clothes that was underneath this clothes, <laughs> essentially. Um, hey, thank, thank you. Thank so um, garments like this, um, it depends on how much you were wearing them. People did tend to like go through clothing. Similarly to like, if you buy a nice pair of work boots, it'll last you much longer than like a pair of Crocs. But like, if you're wearing it consistently and you're wearing it until the end of its kind of lifetime, then it will eventually, you know, no longer be wearable and they'll throw it out. So that's kind of why, especially when it comes to like work clothes or like day wear as compared to like evening wear, you tend to see less of that in collections because people were getting as much as they could out of those garments. People would also like reuse garments if it didn't fit someone anymore. They would remake it to fit, you know, maybe a younger sibling, um, you know, maybe someone who was smaller than them. So people were getting kind of their you know, the lives fully out of these garments as opposed to just wearing them once and, you know, putting it in your closet and forgetting about it. So, yeah. Any other questions? I was, I was wondering, um, uh, the uh, morning, uh, I forgot the name for it, the cape uh, thing. Uh, I was wondering if you had any more information on it. 
Um, and essentially what it is, is it's a kind of popular style of outerwear that became common during the later half of the Victorian era. And it's got kind of, it's a little hard to see, but essentially it sits over the arms and from the front, especially when it's buttoned, looks almost more like a jacket um, because it's got kind of these little sleeve pieces on it. However, from the back, it looks like a cape. I'm just trying to show you guys. Um, so from the back, it looks more like a cape. And these were really, really popular during the time period. We actually have, I think, two more upstairs. Um, but this was kind of my favorite one. And I thought the best example of that style of like sleeve in the front, cape in the back that I was talking about earlier. And it was also a wonderful example of morning wear from this time period. So I don't know like uh, what other kind of information about that you're interested in, but I hope that kind of explains what's going on. <laughs> this is made of yeah, silk. Yeah, did. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, it's made of silk, and um, it's got these wonderful little embellishments on it. But um, and then it's got the lace at the bottom, and yes. So machine made or done by hand? This is machine made. So um, any other questions? If you guys want, we can kind of run the camera back over the garments and take a look at things one more time before we finish up. Okay. Yeah. I'll look at the blue one again. I don't know if we got the back of it. Yeah, just the back. Of this. So oh, we were just getting um, someone noting that we wanted to see the full view of the back of the, the blue dress. So um, as you can see, it's got the bustle on it. It's got a lot of detail in the back. Um, people were kind of just filling as much fabric as they could over their bustles. Um, and then even if you look down here at the bottom, you can see it's got this beautiful pleating, which is something that we didn't see in garments that were, you know, from an earlier time period than this as often, unless you were in a very wealthy situation, because people were able to put more time and effort into that kind of intricate detail work into the bows, into um, the, you know, gathering of the skirt. Down at the front here. Oops, sorry. <laughs> I'll let you guys catch up. It's hard to use. Um, okay. Um, down at the front here, we have this beautiful piping um, and these little epaulets that mirror in the skirt, um, which again is thanks to someone being able to take the time and add these details and beautiful cuffs. So wanted to make sure you guys got to see all of that up close. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Uh, could you just show us the um the, the white dress one more time? The white one over here? The wedding yeah. Dress? Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So this is our earlier dress. This is from around 1840. And it's very identifiable thanks to this kind of V-shaped waistline. Prior to this time period, um, most of the waistlines waist lines were very straight up until kind of the 1830s or so. Um, and it's got this low cut neckline and the little cap sleeves similar to that Victorian style. If they were extended, they might be more like that. And it's it's very similar to that gown that was worn during Queen Victoria's wedding. Um, almost, you know, an exact kind of um, replica. There's a lot of inspiration taken from that dress. Similarly to how nowadays we see people take inspiration from the royal weddings all the time. So she's a very influential person. Let's talk about the waist. Oh yeah, we can talk about the waistline a little bit. Um, yeah, so um, there's this common misconception that people think people were a lot smaller than they are nowadays. That's not the case. Um, this person would have been wearing corsets underneath it, kind of bringing her waist in. People sometimes think that, you know, people were really tight lacing into these corsets. We didn't see that until the very end of the Victorian era. And it was kind of a very specific like subgroup of people who were like, really wanted this tiny waist hourglass silhouette look. Um, she would have been in a corset, um, but it would have just kind of been a special occasion thing. Um, not, no, she would have worn a corset every day, but being this tiny waist, <laughs> this being in this small of a waist size would not have been something people did every day. Um, it also looks a lot smaller than it actually is thanks to kind of the bell shape that the skirt is creating and that silhouette. So it's kind of a mixture of both of those things. So someone just asked about this waist. So that's a little bit about that. Any other questions? Nope, I don't think so. 
Well, we're going to wrap it up. So I just wanted to, again, thank Tori for pulling all these wonderful objects out and showing them to us because so many of them haven't been seen in probably decades, maybe even a century. Who knows? <laughs> um, we hope you tune in again uh, next month. The uh, third and final lecture is in late July, and I will send out a bunch of notices. But uh, I will also, this has been recorded and we'll put it up online. So in case anyone has missed it or wants to share it with anyone, it will be on the adult education page on the website. So thank you all so much. Have a great day. Thank you all for coming.